Okay, I think I'm going to go ahead and get started because we are recording this and it will be available on the Appleton Public Library website later for people to view at another time. Uh, my name is Linda Biella and I am co-chair of the 19th Amendment Centennial Coalition of Women's Groups that came together to plan a year-long celebration of the centennial of the ratification of the 19th Amendment. The group includes the League of Women Voters of Appleton, the AAUW chapter here, Midday Women's Alliance, the Northeast Wisconsin Alumna Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority, and the Women's Fund for the Fox Valley region. When Marty Hemwall asked me to help her lead this coalition about a year ago, I decided I had better get busy and learn as much as I could about the women's suffrage movement. So after reading about five books and doing a lot of internet research, um, I hope that what I can present to you today will give you a better understanding of what those courageous women did about a century ago, where they fell short, and what work we still have before us. I decided to do this presentation in the form of a quiz, which I think is more engaging than just listening to a lecture. So if you would like to test your knowledge um, about what you know regarding women's suffrage, you'll need a piece of scratch paper and something to write with. There are 17 true, false, and multiple choice questions. I would ask that you stay muted during the presentation, but please feel free to type any questions that you might have into the chat box, and I can try to address them when we're finished. And this is a quiz that you cannot fail because if you learn something, you will pass. So here's your first question. Suffrage from the Latin word suffragium refers to what? Correct answer is B. In much older English, the verb suffer also meant to allow. So in the context of women's suffrage, it meant to allow women to vote. What is the difference between the word suffragist and suffragette? The correct answer is C. Suffragette is a derogatory term. It was used to mock the British suffragists who were often quite violent and radical in their tactics, but then they co-opted the term and used it to their advantage. The origins of the women's suffrage movement can be traced to which of these? The correct answer is B, the abolitionist movement. Lucretia Mott, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, and Matilda Jocelyn Gage are all considered to be the founding mothers of the women's suffrage movement. All of them began their activism as abolitionists. Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stanton met at this convention. If you look closely at the, at the painting, you'll notice that the men are the ones who are debating and the women were seated behind a screen to the right. So Mrs. Mott and Mrs. Stanton sat behind that screen and they fumed over their exclusion from this convention. And before they returned to the United States, they determined to hold a women's rights convention in America. Eight years later, they did. The Women's Rights Convention was held in Seneca Falls, and the document drafted for this convention was called what? 
correct answer is C, the Declaration of Sentiments. Elizabeth Cady Stanton was the primary author of this, and she wrote it 72 years after the Declaration of Independence. Interestingly, the 19th Amendment was passed 72 years later in 1920. In addition to this document, there were 11 resolutions presented and only one was controversial, the one asking for women to be able to vote. It was only when the esteemed abolitionist Frederick Douglass spoke to speak, rose to speak in favor of it that it got enough votes to pass. It should be noted that Susan B. Anthony did not attend this convention. She and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who would lead the women's suffrage movement for 50 years, they didn't meet until three years later. They were unlikely allies. Elizabeth Cady Stanton chose the path of family and home. She would go on to have seven children. Susan B. Anthony was raised a Quaker, so she was accustomed to the idea of equality between men and women. She never married because she didn't want to relinquish her rights to a husband. So for 50 years, Stanton was the writer and philosopher and Susan B. Anthony was the activist. Stanton said, she forged the thunderbolts and I fi fired them. So where did these early American suffragists get their reformist ideas? The correct answer is A, from Native American women. You can see on this map that Seneca Falls was located on Iroquois, or more accurately, Haudenosaunee land. Lucretia Mott, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and most notably, Matilda Jocelyn Gage all had contact with these women. What they observed in that society was a stark contrast to what they were experiencing as European American women. Matilda Jocelyn Gage was an outspoken critic of the injustice towards Native American women, and she wrote extensively about them. She must have spent a great deal of time with them because she was initiated into their wolf clan and admitted to its council of matrons. In her writing, she compared the status of Amer Native American women with that of European American women. For these indigenous women, they were living in a matriarchal society. The line of the chief descended through the mother, so it would have been unthinkable for them not to give their women a political voice. For European American women, once they were married, they were essentially dead to the law. They had no right to the family's resources, they had no right to divorce. And in the case of divorce, they even had no right to custody of their children. Since the founding of our country, property ownership was accepted as a prerequisite for voting. And in fact, during colonial times, women who were property owners were allowed to vote. But gradually, colon, colony by colony and state by state, they lost that right to vote. So when the women's suffragists came along in the mid 19th century, they were not really fighting to gain the right to vote, they were fighting to regain it. I think it's interesting that the National American Women's Suffrage Association chose Sacagawea as their emblem. Sacagawea was the woman who guided the Lewis and Clark expedition, you'll remember. But Native Americans not only influenced women suffragists, they influenced the founding fathers as well. Benjamin Franklin served as ambassador to the Iroquois Confederacy, which had existed for four centuries before Columbus arrived. Its government was based on the concept of we the people. In 1988, the US Senate passed a resolution acknowledging 
that the Iroquois Confederacy provided the basis for the U.S. Constitution. Benjamin Franklin invited two representatives of the Iroquois Confederacy to the Constitutional Convention. After they were introduced to the delegates, they had one question. They said, where are your women? So Elizabeth Cady Stanton, did she work to bring her Christian beliefs into the women's suffrage movement? True or false? Actually, nothing could be farther from the truth. Elizabeth Cady Stanton, if she were alive today, she would be considered a radical feminist, which was even more remarkable in her time. In 1895, she published the first volume of the Woman's Bible, which she wrote in a, with a committee of 26 other women, none of whom were Bible scholars, incidentally as a commentary to correct what they thought were incorrect interpretations that were biased against women in the Bible. As you can imagine, the book was met with outrage and condemned as blasphemous, but it was also a bestseller and was translated into six languages. Her literary success, however, cost Elizabeth Cady Stanton her status within the women's suffrage movement and the women's Bible, uh, which, and it was condemned by the Women's Suffrage Association. True or false, did Susan B. Anthony help to pass the reconstructions following the Civil War? And here is a slide that shows those reconstruction amendments, 13, 14, and 15. The answer is false. Look what she said. I would rather cut off my right hand than ask the ballot for the black man and not the woman. This coming from a woman who started her activism as an abolitionist. When the Civil War broke out, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony made a strategic decision. They decided to suspend their campaign for women's rights and focus all their efforts in support of abolition and the union cause. This work provided them a blueprint for the women's rights movement that would follow. And they believed that a grateful nation would reward them with the right to vote. They were wrong. They were told it was the Negro's hour and that women would have to wait. And if you notice, in the Reconstruction Amendments, for number, Amendment 14, use the word male for the very first time um, in the Constitution. And the women suffragists also were working to get the word sex added to the 15th Amendment, but they were unsuccessful. Next question is, what was the first country to grant women suffrage? The correct answer was New Zealand in 1893. France, it wasn't until 1945, and Switzerland, not until 1971. The first US state to include women's suffrage in its constitution was, which one? <clears throat> The correct answer is B, Wyoming. Toward the end of the 19th century, several Western states joined the union with full women's suffrage in their state constitutions. It seemed the natural order of things where the rigors of frontier life required women to work alongside their husbands. So Wyoming was the first and actually had women's suffrage as a territory all the way back in 1869. Colorado followed in 1893, 
after a successful statewide referendum. And by 1918, women had full voting rights in 15 states. So here you can see by 1919, there was a patchwork of different types of women's suffrage across the country. But the bottom line was that there were enough female voters at that time to make them a political consideration. If people didn't support women's suffrage, they really risked being elected. Wisconsin women could vote prior to 1920. Well, that was true in certain cases. There was a referendum that passed in 1886 that allowed women to vote in any election pertaining to school matters. Well, it didn't take very long for the suffragists to test that. And the very next year, one prominent suffragist, the Reverend Olympia Brown, who was the very first woman in the United States ordained by an organized church. She was a Universalist minister and served a congregation in Racine and also for a brief time in Nina. So she went and tried to vote in a municipal election and was turned away. She filed suit and it went all the way to the Wisconsin Supreme Court. She lost. And the court then more narrowly defined the statute to say women can only vote in school elections. The first U.S. president to support women's suffrage was whom? The correct answer was Theodore Roosevelt. In 1912, his Bull Moose Party was the first to include women's suffrage as a plank in its platform. Woodrow Wilson was the president when the 19th Amendment was ratified, but he really came late to the game. He was a Southern Democrat and they were very conservative at the time. His wife was an anti-suffragist, so he didn't really come around to supporting women's suffrage until about 1919. When was the 19th Amendment first proposed? The correct answer was B, 1878. So fast forward now 40 years to 1918. By that time, the suffragists had become skilled lobbyists and they knew that the vote was going to be close. So close that they brought people in on stretchers and from sick beds. And one man was brought in, what came in at the insistence of his wife from her deathbed to cast a vote in the House of Representatives. It passed, but the Senate proved a much tougher fight. It didn't pass in the Senate. And Woodrow Wilson was still reluctant to publicly support it. So at that point, Carrie Chapman Catt, who was leading the National American Women's Suffrage Association, decided to put in motion a plan for making trouble. The organization would cast aside its nonpartisan mantle and actively work to unseat senators who opposed women's suffrage in the fall election of 1918. So when the 66th Congress convened the next year, they would take up the question again. Number 13, the legislatures in Illinois, Michigan, and Wisconsin all ratified the 19th Amendment on June 10th, only five days after it was passed in Congress. Wisconsin was given credit for being the first to ratify. Why? The correct answer was A. Its papers were first to be filed 
So on June 5th, the state legislators, state legislatures were given the papers. And on five days later, those three states voted. Illinois voted first by about 30 minutes. But before the papers could be certified, they had to be hand carried across the country to Washington, DC. It should be noted that in 1912, just seven years prior to this, there was a statewide referendum on women's suffrage in Wisconsin, which failed by a two to one vote. The author of that referendum was Senator David James of Richland Center. So he was the person who was chosen to carry the papers across the country by train. He arrived in Washington, D.C. on June 13th and presented the papers to the Secretary of State and as he was doing that, just minutes later, the delegate from Illinois arrived. But there were some incorrect things on the Illinois papers, so they had to be taken back and the Illinois legislature had to vote a second time. So Wisconsin was given the credit of being first. Appleton was on the forefront of women's, the women's suffrage movement in Wisconsin. Sadly, that is false. There isn't much in the historical record concerning what was going on in Appleton during the years leading up to the ratification of the 19th Amendment. Thanks to Katie Stilp at the library, um, she was able to dig into the Post Crescent ar archives and find some articles that kind of give a glimpse of the way things were going here in Appleton at the time. Um, there was one article that was dated in 1909 that observed, it is doubtful, however, if many Appleton women are in favor of so-called women's rights principles, and the possibilities are that even in the not expected event of full suffrage being extended to them, not one in 10 women would be in favor of it. But not many years later, the tide seemed to have turned a little bit. And there was another article that said, quote, if any city can boast of an intelligent and progressive womanhood, Appleton is that city. So Mina Rogers Win Winslow seems to have been the most prominent Appleton woman to have been in favor of women's suffrage. Uh, she was Outagamie County Political Equity League president. She briefly served as superintendent of schools in Appleton. Um, and she was superintendent when the new school Columbus was built. Um, she that year had been to the Columbian exhibition in Chicago. And so she decided to name this new school because it was so new and modern after that Columbian exhibition. She was also credited with writing the alma mater song for her alma mater, Lawrence University. In 1920, the last of the 36 states that were needed to ratify the 19th Amendment was, which one? Correct answer was Tennessee. Delaware was supposed to have been the last one, but unexpectedly the ratification effort failed there. So in the hot summer of 1920, the entire political apparatus of the country, the suffragists, the antis, the special interest lobbyists, the Republicans and the Democrats in the midst of a presidential campaign all descended on Nashville. They, the representatives in the Tennessee Assembly were given red roses to put in their lapels if they were opposed to women's suffrage and yellow if they were in favor of it. So when the fateful day arrived, it looked as if the red roses outnumbered the yellow roses. But at the very last minute, in a very intense drama, 
a young freshman legislator named Harry Byrne took that red rose out of his lapel and voted in favor. That one vote was the deciding vote. He had followed the admonition of his mother who had sent him a letter that said, don't forget to be a good boy and help Mrs. Cat put the rat in ratification. So that one vote on August 18th, 1920, changed the lives of half the population of the United States. Unbelievably, it took until 1984 for the last of the 50 states to ratify the 19th Amendment, and that was the state of Mississippi. For this question, you're gonna choose two answers. Why were early women suffragists criticized? For which two of these things? One of the correct answer is A, lack of support for women of color. For the white middle and upper class women who led the women's suffrage movement, black women's suffrage was a very thorny problem. Most of them viewed it as a race rather than a gender issue. This book, The Comprehensive History of Women's Suffrage that was written by Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, and Matilda Jocelyn Gage, along with Elizabeth Cady Stanton's daughter, barely mentions African-American suffragists. And some suffragist leaders made a devil's bargain with white Southern politicians, promising more white votes for Jim Crow laws in exchange for their support of women's suffrage. But throughout their country, there were African-American women's clubs working even harder to confront two daunting obstacles, gender and racial inequality. Ida B. Wells was a prominent black suffragist from Chicago who helped found the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs, which later and later helped to found the NAACP. The Delta Sigma Theta sorority was founded in 1913 by 22 women at Howard University. This is the same sorority that is represented in our 19th Amendment coalition. The sorority's first public act was to participate in the 1913 Women's Suffrage Parade in Washington, D.C. Those 22 courageous Delta women, however, were told to march at the end of the parade. Ida B. Wells, always defiant, waited on the sidelines of the parade and when her fellow Illinois suffragists marched by, she jumped in step with them. Women suffragists were also criticized for being part of the temperance movement, which was very controversial at the time. But the reality was if, the, if a husband drank the family's resources dry, she was often left, left destitute to care for children. This was particularly common after the Civil War. Women suffragists, however, in America, were not criticized for violence and destruction of property. That was true of the British suffragists. Alice Paul experienced firsthand the radical tactics in Great Britain. She joined in their demonstrations. She was put in prison. She participated in a hunger strike and she was violently forced fed. So she came back to the US intent on kicking American suffragists into high gear and bringing her impressive Ivy League credentials to the cause of women's suffrage. 
1917, she organized the Silent Sentinels to picket in front of the White House. With American soldiers fighting in World War I, these women were often the object of public scorn and denounced as treasonous. They were arrested, they were sent to a horrible workhouse in Virginia filled with rats and given terrible food. On one particular night, they were violently tortured by the guards. Again, Alice Paul led her fellow suffragists uh, in a hunger strike and they were violently forced fed. Eventually, the word of their mistreatment though leaked to the press and it began to turn public sentiment more in favor of women's suffrage. The last question is, the women's suffrage movement was fractured in the 19th century, but became unified and focused in the 20th century. True or false? Well, that was true. As a result of the controversy over the Reconstruction Amendments, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony parted ways with some of the more conservative suffragists like Lucy Stone Blackwell from Boston, and two organizations em emerged. That set the movement back considerably at the end of the 19th century. Although those two Organizations were joined together in 1890 through the work of Elizabeth Cady Stanton's daughter, Harriet uh, Stanton Blackwell, uh, Blotch, excuse me, and uh, became the National American Women Suffrage Association. That organization would be led by Ch uh, Carrie Chapman Catt. But the question is also false. Although the National American Women's Suffrage Organization had merged, the newly formed NAWSA often found itself at odds with Alice Paul's Women's Party. Carrie Chapman Catt, who had been handpicked by Susan B. Anthony to be her successor, feared public demonstrations would undermine, undermine the fragile coalition that she was building to support the 19th Amendment in Congress. She had a winning plan. It was unveiled in 1916 and called for simultaneously working for suffrage in state legislatures, as well as continuing to lobby for a federal constitutional amendment. The logic was that once a critical mass of enfranchised women was achieved by individual states, a federal amendment would be inevitable. The plan worked just as Kat had envisioned. In 1917, the state of New York finally enacted women's suffrage, and this seemed to break the logjam of opposition to a federal amendment. But Alice Paul also had a plan. The National Women's Party shifted its public protest into high gear culminating with a nation nationwide campaign to sway public opinion called the Prison Special. Women who had been jailed for protesting traveled across the country by train, proudly wearing their Jailed for Freedom pin, and they spoke to over 50,000 people. The result was an avalanche of letters of support sent to Congress by constituents. So by the time the 66th Congress took up the question of, again, in June of 1919, public support was overwhelming and it easily passed both houses of Congress. So which approach was more effective? I would argue that both were needed to succeed. As the state ratifications progressed throughout 1919 and 1920, Alice Paul began sewing a victory banner. After the ratification vote in Tennessee, she was finally able to add the 36th and final star. In 
The amendment was certified on August 26, 1920, Women's Equality Day. Despite the fact that Alice Paul and Carrie Chapman Catt had devoted their entire lives to the cause of women's suffrage, neither of these women were invited to the final private signing ceremony because people fe feared there would be a public spectacle. So who was this a victory for? 1920 was a landmark year for white women voters, but many other women were left behind. It wasn't until 1952 that Asian American women were given the right to vote. Native American women had to wait until 1957. And it wasn't until the Voting Rights Act of 1965 that prohibited barriers to voting for African American women that they were finally able to vote throughout the country. In 2013, the Supreme Court, however, struck down a key provision of that 1965 Voting Rights Act that has opened the door to increasing amounts of voter suppression measures. Once the 19th Amendment was passed, Carrie Chapman Catt founded a new organization which she called a great political experiment that would help the newly enfranchised women carry out their civic duty. That organization is the League of Women Voters, which is also celebrating in its centennial this year. Alice Paul wrote and proposed the Equal Rights Amendment in 1923. It was introduced 48 times in Congress until it finally passed in 1972. In January of this year, 49 years later, the 48th and final state ratification was achieved in Virginia. But there are legal challenges to what is now called the Alice Paul Amendment because five states who originally did ratify rescinded their ratifications. Legal precedent, however, suggests that those challenges won't succeed, but it will undoubtedly be several more years before the ERA can become part of the Constitution. The U.S., incidentally, is one of only 28 countries worldwide without a gender equity provision in its Constitution. So that concludes the presentation that I have for you. And our quiz, which if you remember, I said if you learned something, you passed. I wanted to mention again our um, coalition website, Her Voice, Her Vote, Our Victory .com, which in, contains a lot of other resources like this presentation, as well as important information on voting. Um, so what we have been trying to do with our year-long effort is to bring to light the extraordinary work that these women suffragists did, but also to highlight the work that they left undone and to inspire those who follow us to continue the work for gender equity and safeguard our precious right to vote. I also wanted to share some uh, resources that I used in educating myself on this topic. Um, Sally Rush Wagner, who was our speaker in December, uh, has written the book Sisters in Spirit, which talks about the Native American influence on the suffragist and a very comprehensive anthology of women's suffrage that contains a lot of original documents. Uh, Susan Ware is the author, author of Why They Marched, um, which highlights a lot of stories about suffragists that you don't often hear about in the history books, such as Ida B. Wells. And The Woman's Hour by Elaine Weiss um, is a very engaging page-turning book on what happened in Nashville, Tennessee around the final ratification. Um, Elaine Weiss, incidentally, is coming to speak in Appleton in um, August 
2021 for our Women's Equality Day uh, celebration that year. Um, and finally, the women's suffrage um, volume on the right there is the most, most complete compendium you'll ever find on the topic. Um, also wanted to recommend two PBS documentaries that are very good, One Woman, One Vote, which is kind of an overview of the women's suffrage movement, and um, Not For Ourselves Alone, which really focuses on Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony. So let's un unmute ourselves and, and discuss if you would like to. Um, and I'll just check and see if there are any questions in here. Oh, somebody said, Lawrence is the first university to be co-ed in 1847. Yes, yes, yes. Hooray for Lawrence. <laughs> so, any questions, anybody? No, but I wanted, I can say it was great, Linda. Thank you. And uh, um, I'm so proud of women when I, when I watch this. And even though I've read several of the books, I've watched uh, the documentaries, I got chills again. <laughs> this is not really new information to me, but it, it was so emotional. And uh, I, I just thought it was very well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming in. Anything that surprised you? Well, I still have a question on Lawrence. Uh, is there a Winslow dorm? I don't know, or has anything been named? I mean, I, I feel there should be some equality. She's she was a very vital presence. Yes. Well, we have my daughter Sarah, who's a Lawrence graduate. Sarah, do you know anything about that? I don't think there's a dorm named after her. No. No. Um, I felt I felt very very surprised and and curious to learn more about the the influence of the Iroquois uh, uh, matriarchal society and their their constitution on our political systems and also on this movement. I, I, I want to learn more about that. That was fascinating. Mm -hmm. Sisters in Spirit is a good book for that. Anybody else have any? questions or comments or I have another comment which is that I think that um, you know I think that obviously our country is going through a reckoning now and I think that so I personally work you know I work full-time and and I've been working at home for now three months uh, working like a dog and also carrying you know the burden of of ch the primary burden of childcare, care. Um, and I think that if we move as a society to more um, the ability for people to work, you know, remote, remotely work from home, and theoretically, if the, if the partnership, the, the mother and father are both working from home, I think this is an, a time for some radical changes to childcare and, and the burden of of housework in our society. So um, anyway, just, just sort of a thought mm -hmm. along the lines. Yeah, it really does seem to me like we're at an inflection point in our society right now, for sure. Mm -hmm. I, I have read articles on that, Sarah, uh, internationally. And so whether it's in the Asian countries, European countries, women are speaking out exactly on this issue. There is a, a movement where they have now put down every task that is done in the home. And the expectation is that their husbands do sign up for it because everybody's at home. <laughs> yeah. I see that B has placed a, a comment in the chat or a question, Mom. Oh, yeah. Um, if I know of resources on the African-American women's movement. Um, the book that I had presented by Susan Ware has information on some of that. I don't know of a specific book. Um, Ida B. Wells has some um, 
writing that you can delve into. And uh, her daughter, Michelle Duster from Chicago that came to speak here in March, um, maintains an Ida B. Wells Foundation. So I might direct you to that. Um, not quite sure of the website, but I think if you would Google the Ida B. Wells Foundation, you would find some information there. That might be a good place to start. Any other questions? I thought it was very good. Thank you. And I bet most of the questions wrong. <laughs> I have a lot of reading to do. But did you learn something? Then you, then you passed. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good to see everybody and um, uh, hi Karen. Hi, um, may I make a comment please? Please do. Yes, thank you. As you know, I'm doing double duty. I'm also in the middle, pardon me, <laughs> also in the middle of uh, my sorority meeting right now. So I just uh, muted myself on mic and camera. So I can jump in to let you know, I saw the entire presentation was so moved. I could not be as totally engaged, obviously, watching two meetings at the same time. But I am so, so impressed. Thank you so much. You did a remarkable job on African women, African American women uh, suffragists at that time. And I just wanted to, uh, to say thank you. The only thing I could think of, maybe if we do this again, to add would be the picture from the Michelle Duster event that we had in the program mm. so, that when, so that when you're talking about my sorority, which is the sorority meeting that I'm in right now, <laughs> ironically, um, coincidentally, um, you could also show our 22 founders that one and only picture that we believe in all of history that just happened to have been taken of them in action marching and they did march they did not march at the end of the line they asked them to but they marched with the other university women and we're very very proud of that fact that the 22 founders of delta sigma theta you can see it right here <laughs> i keep it very close <laughs> delta sigma theta sorority incorporated we were there and we're very very proud to be there so thank you so much for doing this virtual suffragist uh, women's movement update and you did a remarkable job linda thank you as a member of the league of women voters and delta sigma theta sorority incorporated <laughs> thank you karen thanks for your uh divided attention and i you know i'm glad you had your sorority meeting this morning too which is wonderful we're so proud thank to have you. you part of our coalition you're welcome thank you linda this is gail um, I just wanted to mention to those on um, this session this morning that as part of our outreach to the community, um, we do have a speakers bureau. And if you know of a group that might have an interest in a presentation, we'll work with you on the link. Uh, we can do it via Zoom. Uh, we, we want to uh, increase awareness um, within the community of the work of, of the suffragists and, and what we're doing, the various groups that have come together. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there for anyone. If you know of a group, if, if book club, uh, church group, whatever, uh, we have a number of very capable women that are willing to uh, speak. Yes, thanks, Gail. Mm -hmm. Very happy to share with anybody and at any length, any length of program too, we can adapt. So. Linda, if we wanted to share this with friends, um, because I'm in Madison, how, do they go to the Appleton Public Library website to find this? Um, I believe so. Is Katie Stelp, are you still on the call? So we're going to put it on our YouTube channel, um, and we're going to also put it on face, our Facebook page. Um, so you can go to our YouTube channel. Um, to get there, you can go through our website or our Facebook. Great. Phenomenal job, Linda. Just so impressive, and I know how hard you've worked, how many books you've read. It's just <laughs> terrific, terrific. Thank you.
Well, thanks. It's, Gail. it's been a it's been a labor of love. I it's really fascinating. I think so. I'm happy to share. Oh, you know what? That reminds me, Linda. I think the only thing that I probably well, I've already made one recommendation. Let me make a second one. Perhaps to at least add at least one of the Michelle Duster books to to the front cover, uh, the, um, the the slide that you have with the front cover of various books for recommended reading. Okay. I think at least the one on Ida B. Wells. If I missed that, please forgive me, but just wanted to uh, to be sure that um, that I mentioned it. Yeah, I do have this that one slide. This one. Okay, very oh, good, excellent. That's a good suggestion, I'll do that. Thank you. Yeah, and I did mention the Ida B. Wells Foundation as a resource on uh, African-American women's history. Too. Oh, very good. Hold on, I've got to go back on, 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 on mute here because my uh, agenda item is coming up on, on sorority meeting. Thank you, <laughs> but I'll, I'll keep in touch, I'll keep it up. Okay, bye-bye. Well, if there's no more questions, I think probably it's a good idea to get out and enjoy this beautiful day. So thank you all for Zooming in, is that a verb now? I think it is. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> okay, great. All right, All right. thanks, Linda. Take Thank care. You. Take Thanks care so of much. Thanks. Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. That was amazing.